Hi, everyone. Good evening or good afternoon, good night or good morning, depending on where you are in the world right now. My name is Laura Apisical, and I'm the Director of Dornsife Admission and Student Success. I'm so honored to be able to greet you today and welcome you to the USC Dornsife family. You've already been through your first week and now four days of classes in our very atypical online semester. You've met your professors, you've read through each course syllabus, and you're starting to dive into lectures, discussions, and labs. How are you feeling so far? As a freshman at USC once upon a time, a pretty long time ago, I remember feeling a mix of excitement and a little anxiety early in my first semester. Has it been more challenging or less challenging than you expected? Are you nervous about exams and papers? Have you started to lay the groundwork for a successful semester, not only this semester, but for the rest of your time at USC by talking with professors, forming study groups, and improving your time management? Today, we will be talking with a few faculty, staff, and current natural science students to help answer some of your questions and concerns related to academic success. I'll be honest, we don't have all the answers, and we won't be able to share with you a foolproof plan to follow for a straight A semester. We are, however, able to provide you with solid advice and tips from people I think very highly of, people who are looking out for you and who want to support you. Because being part of the Dornsife family means that you're part of a community of individuals who care about each other. We know that this semester will have some new challenges, and we know that you are up to the challenge. But we are all here for you if you need some help along the way. Please just don't be afraid to ask for it. Again, welcome to USC Dornsife. Enjoy the program and fight on. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Courtney Bird, and I am one of the team members for the Dornsife Office of Admission and Student Success. We've brought together a really great group of faculty, staff, and student representatives to address your questions and concerns about being academically successful in this virtual learning environment. We're gonna start off with some questions for our faculty and staff panelists. And then after that, we'll have a group of current USC Dornsife students who are all natural science majors as well, answer a few questions. We'll bring all our panelists back at the end to answer any questions that you may have. So we would like you to start thinking about some questions as our panelists speak. And remember that no question is a bad question. We will let you know when you can start typing questions into the Q&A box at the bottom, but feel free to jot down some notes until then. So let's first have our staff and faculty panelists introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Lika. I am the Director of Next Generation Science Programs. Um, we work with Natural Sciences at USC. One of the programs that we're really um, excited to share with everyone is a Supplemental Instruction Program, and that is where a group of students that have successfully completed the course in the past will provide peer-assisted learning sessions um, to work with you all in courses like Bio 120 or Chem 105A, Organic or Physics or Math. So welcome. Hi everyone, um, I'm Professor Parr and I teach mainly in the general chemistry program everywhere from sometimes our introductory class to all the way up through our freshman science honors program. I also have been involved in teaching our um, general education class in chemical um, forensics, which is offered in the spring. Normally this semester or this year, we're actually offering it in the fall and the spring. Um, I'm not teaching at either one of those this year, but I will be in the future. So since you're freshmen, you can look out for that. And um, as far as research goes, I am teaching faculty, so I don't have an official research program, but I'm always trying new things in my classroom to try to improve the experience for my students. Um, in fact, I launched when we're in person an entirely in lab experience for second semester general chemistry, which I am adapting as best I can to our online environment. And um, I also am involved in the women in science and engineering program as the director for the undergraduate programming, which I would be happy to answer questions about. Great. Uh, hi, all. I'm Dave Ginsberg. I am a professor in the environmental studies program. I've uh, been at USC for actually about 20 years now, but I've been teaching as a faculty member for about 12. Um, 
she did my PhD at USC and my background is in marine science. And I am interested in uh, marine protected areas and uh, conservation biodiversity issues off California and in tropical areas and coral reefs, seagrass beds. Um, and I teach a variety of courses uh, everywhere from introductory uh, freshman level classes to advanced classes to I also teach in our uh, progressive master's program, which some of you may have heard about, but it's essentially a fifth year master's program. And I teach some of those 500 level courses too. So, uh, and I'm also the undergraduate, uh, the director of undergraduate studies for our program. So if they have questions related to those things, I can help out there too. Thank you and welcome to our panel. We're gonna get started with our first question, which will be for everyone. So understanding that this semester is different for everyone, what habits have you seen that contribute to students' academic success? Um, I can start with this one. So uh, things that I have seen, whether in person or online, is students who really keep up with the material as it's being presented. So not uh, falling behind is one of the biggest things. Um, that happens. Uh, it's a little bit different right as you're transitioning from possibly having the same classes every single day uh, to now having some classes only three times a week, others only twice a week or even once a week um, to kind of keep up with everything and set a schedule. So most of the successful students have some sort of study schedule they have set aside and do a little bit of work for every class every single day, which sounds like a lot, but actually saves you time in the long run because it helps you to forge those connections a little bit faster than you normally would and cramming right before the exam never really works out that well for anyone. Um, it might for one exam, but eventually it starts to backfire if that's your main study strategy. Um, I may have learned that the hard way as a student, so um, just be aware your faculty, we're not perfect students themselves, um, most of us. I don't know about Dave, but I was not. Um, so we fall into these traps and our advice comes from experience. So, Yeah, I would just add on to that. I, I agree that exactly what you said, Jessica. And uh, uh, the other part is come talk to your, go talk to your faculty, the people that are teaching your classes. Um, I think a lot of times you could be studying and being so diligent about the work and uh, what happens is, is you end up studying the wrong things. And by just having a simple conversation with a faculty member uh, who's teaching the class, you know, you can, you can just get on the right track. Um, but as far as that procrastination part, if you wait to the last minute, it only takes a minute, right? So, but I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> I know from experience as well. So anyways, hopefully that's useful information for you. I would add on to that, making sure that you stay organized. I, it is hard this semester um, with things being so different um, to acclimate to the different times that classes are being offered, um, adjusting to, you know, what class time actually means versus being at home versus a break time. So keeping your times organized, designating, designating actual times to study, designating times to take a break and walk away from any screen, I think is very, very important. Um, and then reaching out to other students. Um, there are a number of students that are really, upperclassmen especially, that are really looking to support um, students in their first year at USC because they um, really feel for you guys as you're experiencing this semester. So there are plenty of student organizations and even the supplemental instructors um, that are really willing to sit down and, and have a conversation with you guys via Zoom about what they experienced when they were going through the class and or some tips and tricks they might have to be successful. So certainly staying organized and reaching out to upperclassmen that you might experience, whether in your classes or as supplemental instructors or in other student organizations. Thank you. Professor Ginsburg, I know you talked a little bit about wanting students to talk to their faculty. And so this question would be for you and for Professor Parr about how can students form connections with faculty members in these large lecture classes and how do you facilitate engagement in your classes over Zoom? Um, I think one of the easiest ways is to just 
just be engaged, ask questions. I mean, I think in, uh, I'm currently teaching two classes that have about 40 people each in them. And, you know, uh, probably a quarter to a little bit more than a quarter of the class speaks up every class, which is great. But, uh, you know, it's, it's more than I would have, I suppose, in a, in a traditional classroom sometimes, which is strange. But I think just making yourself known and and uh, even just shooting me an email. I've had a couple students send me emails with information that they thought I might be interesting. And uh, I usually hold a, a Zoom. I found that, that having, a, I, I make office hours just like I would normally. And I just have a one hour session per week where I just sit there and wait. And, and I've only done two so far, but uh, usually students come on, you know, in that hour that I have. And, and it might just be one student I'm sure at some point there will be no students, but I think that's the best way to talk. And I talk before the lecture and I just stay on the call for about 10 minutes afterwards uh, in a lecture and students talk. So, um, and I definitely turn off the recording and things like that for them, you know, just so they know. But uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's what I do and uh, pretty easy to, to get in touch with me. Yeah, I, I would have to reiterate, um... Email is definitely a great way right now to be in contact with your faculty members, especially if your time zone doesn't quite overlap with what, um, well, they should all be here in Los Angeles, hopefully. Well, I guess they can teach from anywhere, so if they have a second home, they could be there. But most of us are here in Los Angeles. Um, and so email is a great way to stay in touch and make yourself known and introduce yourself to your faculty members but office hours are also great so all um, we're still holding office hours i also have you know one hour a week that i have set up um, i am willing to make appointments outside of that with students to talk about questions they have from class or even just if they have questions on logistics or how to study and how to be prepared i'm happy to answer those as well um, and don't be shy. Uh, so reach out to your faculty members and talk to them. As far as keeping students engaged in class, um, I try to plan things so that I'm not just talking at you for, you know, 50 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes, depending on which of my sections you're in. Um, so I have some pre-recorded experiments that I'm narrating and students are collecting data as we go along and um, then they, we go into breakout groups for a few minutes and they can talk with their peers about that. And we come back and debrief. I've been using Poll Everywhere to do um, questions across the board and um, including some of the functions that they have with word clouds, which make things a little more interesting for responses than just multiple choice. And so faculty are trying our best <laughs> to keep everyone engaged as best we can. Um, so uh, I've tried a few other things that haven't worked out quite as well so far this semester, but we're going to keep working on that. We're all learning as we go. <laughs> Lika, what are some study tips that you can suggest for students who are adjusting to college and attending class, sometimes in their bedrooms? It seems like this environment requires a lot of discipline that many of our new students and even ourselves working from home maybe haven't quite mastered yet. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know for me personally, it took a really long time to get used to working from Zoom in my home. Um, so some of the tips that I've actually gathered from my students, from my peers, um, and other um, education um, staff members have been really helpful. And some of those include um, as simple as it is, really changing out of your PJs. I know it's easy to sit and work in your PJs all day long, but there's this little mental trick that when you're dressed like you're in class, you might actually um, begin to feel like you're more in class than you would be sitting in your pajamas. Um, another tip or trick is, um, you know, I'm certainly mindful that we all have very different home environments in which we are working and or studying from, but designating an actual, even if it's just a corner in your room that is just for study, that really changes kind of your mentality when you're sitting in that corner and just studying rather than using that same corner to also, you know, watch movies or play video games or whatever it may be. So um, determine a space in your room or in the living room or on the dining room table. This space is the only space where you will actually study um, so that any other 
things that you may do or fun things, you will do those in other areas. Again, just to kind of create that mental classroom. Um, keep your camera on as much as you can. Um, I think that's really important because it kind of holds us accountable to continue to pay attention. And sometimes um, when we turn the camera off, distractions seem to make their way into that session. So I would certainly encourage you keep that camera on as much as possible. When you're studying, I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed with the amount of stuff you may have to do. And so one of the techniques that I've actually started implementing is called the Pomodoro technique. Um, and this is a technique where you basically sit for a couple minutes, identify all of your tasks, and then you set a timer for 25 minutes and work for 25 minutes straight, distraction free. Once that timer goes off, you give yourself a five minute break. And in that five minute break, I'll stand up, stretch, walk around, come back and do the same thing in my work designated corner for another 25 minutes. And you do this for about four to five times in a row, then you give yourself a longer 15 to 30 minute break. I found this to be really helpful because it allows me to organize my time. But also in knowing that I'm, really devoting these 25 minutes to get work done without distraction. I'm surprised by how much I can do in such a short amount of time. Um, in comparison to when I tell myself, okay, you have three hours to do all of these things, I tend to get overwhelmed. And then um, I find out that very few things have actually gotten done in those three hours. Um, and then the final thing that I would recommend is as you're studying, I would recommend using headphones to kind of drown out all other noises. Um, and some students really like to listen to music. I'm one of those people that gets distracted by music with lyrics and I start to sing along instead of actually read what I'm supposed to be reading. So I like this app that's called White Noise Light. It's a free app and it just has sounds of the ocean or rain or waves crashing. And I'll just have that um, going on as I'm having those 25 minutes go by um, and I feel like I'm in my own little world getting my work done um, and I'm very quickly amazed by how few um, distractions um, kind of come into that space and actually one of my students suggested white noise light so I'd highly recommend that you download that and um, use that to drown out some of the distractions around. I just wrote the name down myself because that sounds like something I'd be interested in as well. So thank you to our faculty and staff. They will be back for our final Q&A in just a little bit, but we are now going to move on to our student panelists. So if I could have them bring up their cameras and we will do those introductions. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Bryson and I am from uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a rising junior this year. And uh, my major is quantitative biology, so it's a relatively uh, new major uh, in USC Dornsife. And I also just started a PDP in quantitative and computational biology. So it's also in the same department. It's uh, kind of what Dr. Ginsburg mentioned earlier, um, where you, you can take graduate level uh, courses while studying for your undergraduate major. Um, so I've, I've uh, enjoyed like doing both and I'm starting to take classes for both now. Um, my favorite natural science class at USC, I've taken a lot because um, quantitative biology kind of encompasses both the biology chemistry side, like the, like the hard natural sciences side, as well as math and uh, a little bit of computer science. So pretty much like all the classes with uh, SI uh, leaders I've taken before. Um, I really enjoyed, I think, organic chemistry actually, because like it's, it is a hard class and everyone will tell you that, but um, the amount of support that they have for that course, because they have so many students, uh, they really ensure that, you know, you have the resources to succeed in the class. They have SI, they have um, quiz sections, which if you don't have an exam, they actually go through like, or at least for my section, they go through um, practice problems from like previous exams. So that was also really helpful. Um, and there's a lot of office hours for uh, when that, when I took that course as well. So um, as far as like, as far as like the, the amount of resources that that course uh, offered, um, it was really helpful and like a lot of students succeeded because of that. So, um, and I enjoyed the material. So kind of a combination of um, like what the, uh, what like the course uh, directors offered for 
everyone in that class as well as uh, like the material. Um, I, I'd say that that was my favorite natural science class. And it's a lot of, uh, it's a class that a lot of people take. So, um, you know, if you are biochem or any kind of pre-med uh, emphasis, then you'll probably take that class too. And I think uh, definitely take advantage of the resources that they offer. Hi everyone, my name is Samantha or Sam. Um, I'm also a junior, originally from Williamsburg, Virginia, but now in New York City, where it just started thunderstorming really hard out of nowhere. I don't know if anyone in the audience is here, but that was crazy. Um, I am an applied math and international relations double major with a minor in applied analytics. Um, my favorite natural science class, uh, I'm really excited for one of the math classes I'm taking this semester called numerical methods, which is basically about how to solve math problems with programming that you can't solve by hand. Um, but the class that made me decide to be a math major was Calc 3 um, that I took my freshman year, but my professor was incredible. We're still in touch today. Um, when the pandemic got really bad in New York City, she emailed me and like asked if I was okay. So I guess that just shows that professors care about you and are there to support you. So yeah. My name is Elizabeth. I am a senior studying physics and computer science. And I'm from Dallas, Texas, which is where I'm chilling right now. And then um, my favorite natural science class was one that I took in the spring. It was thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. And um, like Samantha said, um, I really liked the professor. He was super supportive. His name is Mohammed El Najjar, and he just goes by Mo. Um, and when COVID started, um, he really like made an effort to like ask how we were doing. And at one point we had a little class get together. It was supposed to be like a lunch a little pizza lunch that we had planned, but then obviously there was no more free food and it was on Zoom. So it was a little sad, but it's okay. He was still great. And then like for each of us students, as we came in, he was like, oh, hey, Elizabeth, how are you doing? You know, like he addressed each of us individually and by name. And it was really sweet to see that he was checking in on us. And as for the actual class, the class was also very cool. And um, this summer I ended up doing research using primarily the concepts that I learned from that class. And that was super unexpected because I had been working with a different research topic um, in an experimental lab. But then since I could no longer go into lab, I started working on a theoretical project and I was doing um, programming for Monte Carlo simulations. And so I was using, calculating a lot of thermodynamic quantities like entropy and free energy. So it was cool to see how that like unexpected situation um, was like, okay, because I was able to tie in stuff that I prepared from my class. Hi everyone, my name is Lena. I'm a senior and I'm from Visalia, California. I'm currently studying human biology and I have minors in mathematics and medical anthropology. My favorite natural science class is definitely HBio360, Nutrition and Disease. I took it my sophomore year with Dr. Polidori, who I ended up taking um, two more of her classes. And I've also had a great experience with Dr. Polidori as a professor, and she ended up writing one of my letters of recommendation for medical school. So I really enjoyed that class. It had a lot of like case studies, so we got a lot of like practical information from that, and I really enjoyed it. All right, thank you everyone. So these questions will be for all of our students on our panel. And we're gonna start with, what do you most enjoy about your natural sciences major? Let's start with Bryson. I think the, um, if you come to like an institution like USC, um, the amount of opportunities for research, which I'm sure like all the student panelists can attest to, um, are really like, there's so many opportunities for students um, which you might not find at, uh, at other schools. Um, and because USC has so many, you know, resources and faculty doing research, um, it also offers the resources for students to be able to get involved um, with like certain faculty members or, uh, you know, looking into research topics that they're interested in. Um, so I think uh, part of being a natural sciences major in Dornsev is having those opportunities, having the opportunities to, um, you know, find faculty that you're interested in working with, 
um, apply for funding through different uh, funding programs that Dornsec offers, either for the summer or during the school year. Um, and just being able to, uh, you know, have access to all these, uh, all these faculty who are doing really incredible research and, and being able to work with them. I think what I enjoy most about um, my applied math major is the flexibility in the program. Um, everyone has to take, you know, the same set of foundational math classes, but there's also a series of upper division electives that you can take in any department that has some sort of like significant quantitative aspect. And so I chose to take all of my electives in economics because I'm also an international relations major. So I was kind of interested in studying like that intersection of how quantitative ideas can be applied to social science. Um, but, you know, people do them in computer science or engineering or physics. Um, and so I think that's been one of my favorite parts of my major. What I really like about being a physics computer science joint major is that the two fields definitely complement each other. And I definitely see how they like um, they approach problems from very different mindsets. And I hadn't expected that going in. Um, what's interesting is I have a friend who's also a physics computer science major, and he's more focused on like the computer science side. After graduating, he's going to go and become a software engineer. Whereas for me, um, my main thing is physics, and I'm using CS and those programming skills to supplement that. And as I talked about earlier, with using programming for my research. And so for me, I'm planning to go to physics grad school. And it's interesting to see how this one major can lead to like many different career trajectories. And I think it's really cool how they approach problems from very different ways. In the sense that like physics, uh, we have some like formulas and some like approximations and models that we use to like approach a problem. But then for computer science, what I've seen is that we're like organizing we're organizing data structures and we have to think more about how these like functions interact in our code and so it's definitely like it's definitely taught me how to approach problems from different perspectives and that's been incredibly useful and elena yeah so what i enjoy the most about um, the human biology majors that we have specific tracks. And I think this ties into what Samantha was saying is that it's really flexible and based on like what you are most interested in. And so I was able to choose a track that had the classes that really spoke to me and I thought would best prepare me for um, a career in medicine that I hope to enter into. And also I would add on um, just like the community I made some of my closest friends in the classes that I took for my major and also being connected with faculty and professors, as Bryson mentioned. Thank you. So our next question is, what are some helpful practices that you have instituted for this virtual semester? And this will be for uh, everyone. Uh, uh, I think the most important thing for me so far has been maintaining a schedule like Google Calendar. Um, because I'm, yeah, I'm sure everyone has uh, been using it since uh, the semester started. Um, it really helps me stay on top of like when I have classes and meetings and all kinds of things going on. Um, and it really helps you stay organized so that you don't, you know, what uh, like some of the faculty panels have been saying about staying on top of like your work and uh, being able to time manage and all that. You're keeping a schedule and like uh, planning everything ahead of time really helps you stay on top of things. Um, and especially like if you're in a different time zone, it's easy to, um, you know, keep track of things at certain times. You have to stay on like LA time kind of because of, uh, you know, everyone being in, uh, in LA or like around USC. Uh, so like I've, I've needed it to stay on top of like certain times that I have uh, things planned for because of time zone difference. So I think maintaining like a, like whatever you want to use, any kind of application to maintain um, a schedule and regularly keeping up with that schedule. Um, so that you can keep track of when you have events planned, classes, all sorts of things. Yeah, I'll um, second what Bryson was saying. I think something that's been really crucial for me has been just like maintaining a routine. Um, I remember when classes first went online, you know, I went back to the East Coast and then sometimes I wouldn't have anything till 2 p.m. So I kind of became nocturnal and I would like wake up at very different times every day and it was a mess. So this semester, what I'm trying to institute for myself 
um, is to, you know, wake up at like a normal hour <laughs> and wake up and go to sleep at the same time every single day. Um, and then something else I would say is just like keeping in mind that um, college is as much about, you know, the, like the small interactions that you have with your roommates and your classmates as it is about studying and academics. And I think that those interactions are still possible um, in an online environment. You just have to be a little bit more intentional about how you do it. So, um, for example, one of my good friends and I were both on an Eastern time zone. So we have like a morning Zoom meeting where we just like drink coffee and study together um, on Zoom, like just both on mute, but at least we're like kind of spending time together in that way. Um, so I think as freshmen, like a thing to remember is I think everyone's kind of like craving that sort of human interaction in one way or another. So if you reach out to someone else, you might be doing them a favor because, you know, everyone wants to have friends and talk and interact with people. I definitely echo what Samantha was saying about like reaching out and like making friends. I remember that was definitely my biggest concern about coming to college. I was like, how am I going to make friends? How's that going to work? But remember, everyone's desperate to make friends. So that's okay. And then especially with like this semester, um, definitely like working on emotional and like mental well-being has been super important. I, uh, I also like something my eye doctor told me to do that I actually started listening to was like to set a looping timer every like 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so then when that goes off, I like rest my eyes. I like take my eyes from like that narrow focus of my computer, like look out 20 feet or so away and then just like rest for like 20 seconds. Or I'll like to go and like do some squats, do like quick little workout. Um, and that's super helpful. And then um, one thing that, that really helped me in the past. I'm not sure how it's changed with the virtual semester, but like USC has this really great resource called the Korchak Learning Center. And this is spelled K-O-R-T-S-C-H-A-K. -K. And I can also just write it in the chat later. Um, and so like, this is a really great resource um, where you learn, where I was learning how to be a student. And initially I was thinking like, okay, why would I need to do that? I've been a student for like 18 years of my life now. I know how to do this, thanks. But then I was like, wait, Elizabeth, you procrastinate a lot, so you could really work on that. And so I would meet with my um, academic counselor. I don't know what the exact term was, but her name was Rosalva. She was really great. And then every week I would tell her like, like this is my schedule. This is my goal for the week. Um, and this is just the routine that we got into and like, it would change with every, um, every advisor with each student in each session. Um, and so it was really great to be able to like work on different learning techniques. So, like every week she would kind of like, pull out a new worksheet and be like, this is a technique you could implement. Um, and it was cool to try different techniques. Um, like, like I'd mentioned earlier, the Pomodoro technique was something that we'd explored. Or if you guys have heard of like the Eisenhower matrix of, pro of productivity to, that helps you like, break down your tasks in terms of your priorities. And so, um, it's really helpful to also talk to someone, talk to some person to like schedule a time and to figure out how you're going to approach your tasks for the week. And I like, highly recommend it. It's not at all like embarrassing to have to talk to someone about how to study. It's like super helpful. And really, I think it's like quite like a testament to say like, okay, this is something I want to work on. I want to have better study habits, better time management. And so instead of just sitting here and floundering on my own, as I do and just watch Netflix, I'm going to get up and like talk to someone and like build better habits. I mean, I have to agree with everything that has been said. I think for me personally, I think what has been bothering me the most about this virtual semester is that I don't have to, or I can't like walk in between classes. And so I really miss that. So I think what I've been doing similar to what Elizabeth mentioned is that in between classes, I sort of like just walk around my room as if I'm like walking to class and just, you know, getting some exercise in. Sometimes we don't wanna be sitting, you know, on a chair for such a long time. And also I would say take use of the Zoom features that you have. So if you're ever in class, um, you know, and you need a little break, just turn off your camera, mute yourself and just like sit up, stretch, you know, rest your eyes. If you're straining from looking at the screen, um, 
Yeah, so those are the tips that I would add. All very good advice. And Laura has shared the link for the Court Shack Center in the chat. And so they are running full force ahead with all of their programming this fall, so you can check out their website for their events and their services. So thank you to our student panelists for sharing your experiences. Now we are going to bring back all of our panelists, and we're going to start with some questions that you actually submitted when you RSVP'd for this session. And then we are also going to open up the live Q&A. So if you do have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A box below. We will answer some questions live, and you can specify if your question is for a specific person, or if you're directing your questions to students versus staff. And then additionally, some members of the Dornsife Admission and Student Success Office will be answering some of the questions. And so make sure you check the answered tab in the Q&A box. All right. So our first question is going to be for everyone and anyone who would like to answer. Do you have any tips to succeed when taking two science classes in the same semester? Um, I'll get started as a faculty member, but also someone who went through this many years ago, not virtual, but still. Um, I was a chemistry major, so I've been there. I think, again, just kind of staying on top of the material, but also keep in mind that um, you need to schedule in some time that is not science. <laughs> um, and this is actually something I tell my science majors all the time. Try to have one class a semester that is not a science class so that you can give yourself your brain a break from science all of the time. And then you can come back and you actually find that you can focus more. So it's not even to distract yourself from the science, but sometimes taking a step back when you're getting really kind of too focused on a problem helps you look at it in a different way when you return to it. So um, keep organized, keep on top of things. Everyone, um, it's probably my generation, but I use a physical calendar. If I don't write it down, it doesn't get done. So um, I have my little, I get reminders in my email for some meetings and then everything else goes into my physical planner still and I have calendars all over the place. So um, for me, I need to write it down. Um, my mom used to get mad at me in high school because I'd always write my assignments on my hand, but I told her I'd lose a piece of paper, but I'm not going to lose my hand. So um, keep a note of the things you have to do and kind of keep track of what order you have to do them in. It's definitely doable. Everybody does two science classes as science majors, sometimes three or a math class on top of it. Um, but the students probably have even better advice than I do. Uh, oh, oh go yeah. ahead, Bryson. Uh, I was going to suggest uh, attending SI sessions, which I would highly encourage you to do. Um, I think, uh, you know, with all the science classes that, uh, that uh, usually underclassmen have to take, uh, we have SI leaders for pretty much all of them. And uh, because, like I've had lots of different natural science classes, like for bio and chem and math. And I've attended the sessions for each of them and they've been really, um, really good resources for succeeding in the class. Um, and I feel like what, uh, what the question is going back to, like, like I've taken a lot of science classes uh, each semester and kind of overloaded, but having SI sessions to kind of review the material and have like time to set aside um, to go over and like ask questions from previous week's lecture um, is really helpful to have. And just uh, like having an SI leader to go to when you have questions, I think is a really good resource. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing, Bryson. I, I don't think there has been a semester I've had at USC where I haven't taken um, at least two science classes. And SI has been so helpful for me as well. And I also think that you can form study groups in your classes. I know this year, since the semester is virtual, I think Dornsife has created Slack channels for each of your classes. So um, make use of those, send a message, you know, be the brave soul and send a message to your classmates, be like, hey, does anyone want to study with me? And I think everyone, and there's like at least one other person in your class who would definitely appreciate that. So um, create your study groups. I found it very helpful to review with my friends in my classes. Uh, 
Um, in addition to like uh, study groups and like supplemental instruction, uh, one thing that has been a really helpful habit for me is that I like to review my class notes every week. And so this is super helpful because um, I like to like look at my notes and then rewrite them um, and then just write like the summary ideas, just the most, the most like important ideas. So then this helps me figure out like what are the most important ideas because it like means that I have to think about it, right? And I have to like figure that out myself. And then when I'm studying for exams or finals, it means I don't have to parse through like a whole bunch of notes. I have like a shorter stack of notes that I can now go through. And um, this is super helpful, like a reference. And then of course, studying my like, class notes helps, um, helps when I'm like doing the homework. Thank you. So our next question, oh, go ahead, Lika. I was just going to add from a planning perspective, if you are able to plan out your classes if, and you are taking multiple sciences a semester, I would say try to balance out a qualitative science class with a quantitative science class just to give your mind a little bit of a break from very dense material and, you know, that way you can kind of use different ways to study versus just constantly, um, you know, trying to absorb as much, you know, thick, dense material. Um, as much as you can in that semester. So that's if you can plan that out. Sometimes um, our majors limit that for us. Very helpful, thank you. Our next question is about research. Students would like to know, what does research look like in a virtual setting? Is research available for freshmen or when should I start research? And maybe what are some summer opportunity research um, for example, our problems about passports or May Masters uh, that Professor Ginsburg might be able to speak to as well. So maybe we could start with you and then move to any students who have participated in research in this virtual sphere. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think research is very, uh, it's very accessible and it's available at USC. Um, and I think all of the, the students here today on the panel can probably attest to that. I think sometimes it's hard in your freshman year to get experience doing things only because you're not really a proven quantity yet but that doesn't mean people don't want to work with you i mean it's just nobody knows you so it helps to uh, i think the progression sometimes starts with uh, a lot of students will you know they want to do the research and then they kind of think i just have to get in the research and then they ask what they're doing versus find out what you're doing and what you like and then talk to people about it um but yeah, it's, it's definitely available. And I, I never tell, everyone's different. So I've, I, I've, I've learned my lesson on that one of saying, you know, oh yeah, don't do the research in your first year. And then it's like, oh yeah, well I did and it was great. But um, there are some professors that will take, you know, like a small army of students and you're washing dishes in a sink all day, like maybe in a chem lab, because there are a lot of things you can't do in a chemistry lab because you don't have the training. Um, and then you might be sitting in someone's lab with a computer and, and just doing coding all day or something. So it, you kind of have to get the, kind of get a feel for what's happening. Um, and then outside of that are the summer opportunities. And there are just amazing, uh, I, I, amazing opportunities out there that never existed when I'm sure Jessica and, and I and others were going to school. I mean, there's so many great opportunities, especially ones that are targeted towards specific you know, students, whether it's, um, uh, you know, first gen students or, you know, for, uh, you know, African American or Latino or whatever it happens to be. And USC has all of those. Um, there's a program called Research Experience for Undergraduate, which, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And one of the priorities of that program is to get, you know, students that have not had the opportunities to do research involved. And, uh, and, and that's, something we do at USC and other places. Uh, and there's a lot of really, and there's problems without passports, which is another thing. So I, I better shut up before I keep going, but there are a ton of things to get involved with. And also I think it was Jessica that mentioned the, the um, women in engineering and science or women, women, yeah, women in science and engineering wise. Um, I think there are opportunities through there too, but um, I know that organization has been really beneficial to some of my students, but uh, I'm not sure for the, for the level we're talking about, but she could probably speak to that. 
I'll just add quickly, yes. So um, WISE, we have summer funding. We also have funding um, during the semester. We have a fellowship program. Um, so there are lots of funding opportunities. And at least in the chemistry department, everyone who we take on, we encourage faculty to not just have them wash dishes, find something they can do. Um, but uh, the students can probably talk a little more about if they've done research in the virtual uh, experience, but we actually did continue the women in science and engineering program uh, this summer. And we had eight students who participated and had different research experiences from what they had originally planned, but still very significant ones. And we had a pretty fun little mini Zoom conference um, at the end of the summer. Have any of our students participated in research virtually? Yeah, so I actually did. It was over the summer and it was through um, USC's Joint Educational Program Project. I'm not quite sure <laughs> what the P stands for, but either that word. Um, but yeah, it was a great opportunity and it was supposed to be in person, but they transitioned it um, into a virtual setting. And I ended up doing a qualitative project on COVID-19 and homeless service providers in Los Angeles County. And it was a great opportunity. Um, I used to do research on campus, um, but unfortunately, like I, I'm not returning to campus, so I can't do a lot of the work that I've done for that research opportunity. But um, I'm still connected with my um, PI, my principal investigator, and just like reviewing articles or assisting in any way that I can do virtually. Just to add to that, I did a virtual project with a student this summer. I think he was a junior, but we did it out at Catalina Island as part of the, the Wrigley Institute. And we met once a week and did a, a, a nice project and he presented it at the end of the summer. So yeah, it is possible to do virtual things. And actually it's, it sounds kind of hokey at times, but there are a lot, you know, people are still trying to get research done. So if you have an idea about something, especially the computer programmers out there, um, God, I wish I had a student that knew programming because there's so, so many things that you could do. But uh, uh, there are people in computational, molecular and computational biology right now uh, that, you know, I knew a group that was using like 10 undergraduates to, to do a project looking at biodiversity in Southern California. So, uh, and it required coding, you know, which no biology student could do. So um, anyways, or very few could do. So, anyways, that's all I have to say. I'll add to that that I think it takes a lot of initiative to get research and so um, one of the things especially as a freshman that you'll need to do is just make sure that you are reaching out to faculty letting them know um, that you're available and you're interested but being specific about what you're interested in um, to help the faculty member understand that you really are invested in their project versus you're just kind of sending out random emails and just, you know, trying to see if anyone responds. So making sure that your email articulates how invested you are or how interested you are in their project and why you would be a good addition to their group. And sometimes more than one email is necessary. <laughs> it definitely is a pretty, well, for me, it was a little daunting process to figure out how to like find research opportunities. Um, I remember it's not, it's not as streamlined as say a college application where there's like a really nice application, you fill it out, it gets sent out to whomever. But then for like when I was finding research opportunities, I went to a professor in our physics department and I said, I want to do research. Oh, this was my freshman year spring semester. And so I'd taken one whole physics class, actually still was in the middle of that physics class. And I was like, hello, I have taken introductory mechanics, but I would like to do research. And the word quantum sounds cool. So I would like to do research in something that involves quantum physics. And so he was like, great. Here's a list of like maybe seven professors who do research in that. And then I had been thinking to do research with someone in the physics department because I thought that would be the most relevant for me. But then he pointed out that you could also work with a professor in the chemistry department, or we have a professor who does like our Mo, the professor I mentioned earlier for my thermo class, thermodynamics class, he does research with like biophysics. And so he combines biology, chemistry, and physics. And so it's important to like keep an open mind with that. Um, and then, so 
this professor had sent me a list of like, say like seven professors who had, um, who were doing work in like quantum physics and like condensed matter physics and such. And so I like emailed each of these professors individually. And as um, like I was talking about earlier, we want to show that we're actually invested in their work. We're not just sending out mass emails, even though we are. And so I like sent my resume, um, I attached that. And then I said, like, my name is Elizabeth So. I'm a freshman studying physics and computer science. I'm interested in your work in, and then this is the part where I would like look up their specific website and read a little bit about their like work. Um, just like going through the website. I wouldn't say it's expected for people entering research, especially now as first years to have like read their like published articles, but just to have like some idea of like what their work entails to show that you're actually invested in them. Um, and then I would say like, oh, could I, could I meet with you to like discuss this? And then hopefully they respond. If not in a week, you could like send them a reminder email. Um, and then usually if like professors aren't responding, it doesn't mean that they like personally don't like you or they're like annoyed. Um, it's just because professors are very busy. And so it's like totally okay. And then um, usually like professors are like willing to meet with you. And even one professor who said that he wouldn't be able to take on any other undergraduate students when I like persisted and asked if I could still meet with him. And he was still like open to talking and he said he could help me with like my, my like, course plan and like, career trajectory ideas. And he was like really helpful. And he's still a mentor to me today. So we've talked a lot about how students are taking what they're learning in their classrooms and wanting to be successful and you know building these relationships with the professors and so to be successful one of the resources that is available is supplemental instruction so lika how do students participate in si instruction and how does the tutoring work on zoom sure so actually bryson Choi is one of our supplemental instructors this year we're really excited um he's a group but for all of you in entry level science classes, you will have had a supplemental instructor introduce themselves to the class um, in the first week of school. Um, and they will share with you an email in which you can use to contact them and then also their Zoom link. So all of our SI sessions this year are happening over Zoom. If you forget who your supplemental instructor is and or what times and days their SI sessions are. If you Google USC SI, you will get our website, which will have all of that information there. Um, anyone can join, anyone can, and can participate. It is free to all students. Um, and we will be offering and are offering multiple sessions throughout the week. You can attend one, you can attend all, um, but these um, sessions are going to happen on a weekly basis. And then also you will have an extended exam review that'll happen um, about a week or so before the exam, just to give you enough time to kind of go over what um, the practice material has for you, but also to give you opportunities to ask questions of your SI leader and or your professor about any material that you didn't understand during the SI session. Thank you. Very yeah, much. I, uh, oh, Go sorry. ahead, Bryson. I could, I could ahead. add on to that and just, well, Absolutely. also, Elizabeth was my uh, SI leader for the same class I am SI for, so we kind of have a generational thing going on here, but um, I would definitely recommend if you do have a class with uh, what's an SI leader, um, just don't like hesitate to ask them if you have any questions. Um, you know, they're there as a resource for you. So just like, don't be, don't be shy if you have questions about the material. Just wanted to add on that. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you very much to all of our panelists and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Please continue to check your weekly Dornsife Connection newsletter emails from Dornsife Admission because we will be sending out more information about events and information about our office coming up. Next week, we have a session on involvement opportunities. So please keep an eye out for that. If we weren't able to respond to your questions, please feel free to reach out to us. A member of our staff is going to be sharing our contact information in the chat in just a moment. So please feel free to reach out to us via email and also check out our social media. And there it goes, perfect, it's in the chat. All right, so if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Thank you so much for joining us today and fight on.